And so Kabul would have to study the strategic environment following the Sunnah of the Prophet and take initiatives in order to modify the strategic environment and make it more favorable for him. That is the Sunnah. When, um, when Kabul wakes up and when you create a generation of scholars who are capable of turning to the Quran to deliver the substance of a Khilafah state, then Kabul will have to <coughs> deliver to the world, spectacularly so. And the diplomats in Islamabad, in the foreign ministry, will be left, will be left wondering, <laughs> where did this come from? Kabul will give to the world, listen carefully, not just what is a Khilafah state, but what is the Islamic conception of an international order? What is the Islamic conception of an international order? What is Pax Islamica? The modern West gave us Pax Britannica and gave us Pax Americana. And uh, Israel is now poised to deliver Pax Judaica. How does that differ from Pax Islamica? They don't teach this subject in the Darul Ulum. And I cannot today, in the limited time that we have, I can't give you a lecture today on the Islamic conception of an international order or Pax Islamica. That will have to wait for another day. But it is a beautiful subject. The Islamic conception of an international order which emerges from the Quran. But Kabul will have to do more than that. It's not going to be easy. <laughs> If you want to establish a genuine Islamic Khilafah state, because the first thing we look at to judge whether or not you are a Khilafah state is not your external relations, <laughs> it's your economy. It's your economy. And if you give us a bogus economy, like the one which obtains in Pakistan, like the one which obtains in Pakistan, a bogus economy, an economy which produces over time slave masters and slaves. <laughs> an economy which produces slave masters and slaves. That's what Pakistan has produced over so long. And there's nothing in the horizon, nothing, nothing, nothing which is challenging it. Your muftis and your maulanas and your shuyuk and your Islamic organizations have mounted no challenge to the economy. None. They are busy either eating biryani and going home and sleep or picking up boxing gloves for their tamasha. They open the brill, we this, that, the other. You know, Ayub Khan wrote the book in the 1950s friends, not masters. 
He was sending a message to the West that we are prepared to be friends with you, but we're not going to be your slaves. But the Latin American diplomat, Juan Domingo Alvarado, he wrote a more beautiful book. <laughs> the, title, the title of his book was Sharks and Sardines. And that's what we have today in the economy, sharks and sardines. The sardines are those who have to leave their wives and their children in the village. Because if they're in the village, they can only earn about 12000 a month. But village can't pay anything better than that. And they have to leave the village and come to Islamabad. And when they come to Islamabad, then because Islamabad doesn't have knowledge, because no one is teaching Islamabad, so they have no knowledge. So they believe that the market wage is a valid wage. And if the market says that the wage for the cook Kansama is 15,000 or 18,000 and the wage for the chokidar or the security guard is 16,000 and the wage for the gardener is 15,000 and we pay the market wage and we can go home and sleep. We can go in the masjid perform our salat. We are good Muslims. We are paying the market wage. <laughs> well, I have a Message for you, Afghanistan. Pakistan has failed and failed miserably. And there's nothing in the horizon to see that we can see that there is any hope for Pakistan to change their economy. But we will judge you in Afghanistan based on your economy. Based on your economy. If you're paying that man that wage and his wife and children have to remain in the village and he doesn't have the means to even go back every weekend so he'll go back once every few months and see so the children <laughs> they don't have papa every night the children are going to sleep and they don't have papa but your children have papa. You're paying him the wage of a slave. Because you will not put your son to work for that wage. But that's the wage of a slave. But they don't know it. They're innocent. Nobody taught them the subject. So Afghanistan, you're going to have to teach Pakistan. That's what a message I'm sending to you. You have to tell Pakistan, our prophet said, he said, give the slave to eat the food that you eat. And give your slave to wear the clothes that you wear. And mashallah, there are Pakistanis who are very kind to their servants and treat them very nicely, alhamdulillah. I just got the news. I, I spent the night in um, Naushela, beautiful city, green and nice. And I learned that uh, the, 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 the man who is employing the Chaukidar, he built a house for him. <laughs> so that his wife and children can come so the children will have papa so this is Pakistan but what do you do? give your slave to eat the food that you eat and give him to wear the clothes that you wear answer until such time 
as you can eliminate riba from the economy, you can't be called a killer for state. So we'll judge Kabul. We'll judge Afghanistan based on the economy. Until such time as you can eliminate riba from the economy, and then the market wage will be a just wage. That with this wage, this man is able to maintain his family. He can bring his wife and children from the village. He can get a home. He can spend enough to be able to maintain them. Until such time, what do you do? Answer, if you have to employ servants, then you have to make them part of your family. You cannot negotiate a wage with them. No. You have to find out what are his needs. How can I get him to bring his wife and his children so the children can have papa? How can I provide a place for them to live? They must have enough food to eat. They must have clothes to wear. If this man is going to work for me full time, full time, then I have to ensure that his family is taken care of. But not, this is for Pakistan, but for Afghanistan, it is not possible to restore the economy that the Khilafah state requires if you continue to have this bogus monetary system. So what they could not do 25 years ago, may Allah open a door that they'll now be able to see the light and bring dinar and dirham as legal tender in Afghanistan. Nobody in Pakistan is calling for that. <laughs> no mufti is saying that this paper money is haram, none. Secondly, not only do you have to bring dinar and dirham back as legal tender, but you have to ensure that you are not a member state of the IMF because the IMF prohibits the use of gold as money. And forget it about being a member of the United Nations. If Afghanistan establishes that profile, Pakistan, you're in trouble. Oh, yes. <laughs> Secondly, you cannot have a banking system in Afghanistan with money being lent on interest to the commercial banks, to the front door. And then money being lent on interest to the Islamic banks, to the back door. The banking system has to go. And those who have money and want to invest, instead of lending it on interest, must do like all others and come in the market and invest. When I come back, inshallah, if Allah allows me to come back, I will teach the subject of riba, which is fundamental for successfully establishing a Khilafah state. As of today, the Darulum has failed. The Darulum has failed and failed miserably in teaching the subject of riba. <laughs> Whereas riba of the modern age has come from Dajjal and is meant to enslave you. So if there is to be an, a Khilafah state in Afghanistan, tell them we're going to be looking at your economy. And as of now, you don't have the knowledge to deal 
with the economy in the modern world. You don't have that knowledge. You need to be humble and learn from others. Pakistan, the elite, they don't want to learn. They don't want to learn. But the students, the university students, mashallah, they are hungry for knowledge in Pakistan. So I'm confident that we'll have a new generation of scholars in Pakistan tomorrow. But the same thing can happen in Afghanistan. I met with a very senior government official. He came to see me in Peshawar. And he agreed with me that the Darul Um was not doing the job it's supposed to be doing. And he said to me, I want to establish an institution of Islamic studies here in Peshawar. We shall bring the correct Islam from the Quran and will be taught all over KPK and that Afghanistan can benefit. I said, if you want to do that, I'm here to help you. <laughs> I'm here to help you with that. And in that effort of teaching, the economy to occupies the most important position. We now move on. The world will be watching Afghanistan now. 25 years ago, we didn't have the internet. We didn't have YouTube. We didn't have Google. We didn't have uh, something called Twitter. I don't know what it is. I don't know. I don't know about them, but I heard about them. But today, 25 years later, you are on the stage of the world. Everything that is going to happen in Afghanistan is going to be recorded on these phones. And they'll be sent out. And they'll be broadcast all over the world. And you're going to face a public relations disaster if you make mistakes. So this is my warning to you.